and today we're going to be reading chapter two from The Hobbit. Here's a few questions that you can answer as I read along. Question one, what did Bilbo do when he woke up? Question two, how did Bilbo feel when he found the dwarves gone? Question three, when Bilbo joins the dwarves, what has he forgotten? Question four, what season is it when the party sets out on their adventure? Question five, what skill are we told that Bilbo possesses that makes him a particularly good burglar? Question six, who captures Bilbo and how do they capture him? Question seven, what does the party find in the cave? And what does Bilbo take from the cave? Also, see if you can look up the definitions of the following words that we're going to read in this chapter. The words are esteemed, paraphernalia, and applicable. So let's start reading chapter two, roast mutton. Up jumped Bilbo and putting on his dressing gown went into the dining room. There he saw nobody, but all the signs of a large and hurried breakfast. There was a fearful mess in the room and piles of unwashed crocks in the kitchen. Nearly every pot and pan he possessed seemed to have been used. The washing up was so dismally real that Bilbo was forced to believe that the party of the night before hadn't been a part of his bad dreams as he had hoped. Indeed, he was relieved after all to think they had gone without him and without bothering to wake him up. But not even with a thank you, he thought. But yet in a way, he couldn't help feeling just a little bit disappointed. And the feeling surprised him. Don't be a fool, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself, thinking of dragons and all that outlandish nonsense at your age. He put on an apron, lit some fires, boiled some water and washed up. Then he had a nice little breakfast in the kitchen before going into the dining room. By that time, the sun was shining and the front door was open, letting in a warm spring breeze. Bilbo began to whistle loudly and to forget about the night before. In fact, he was just sitting down to a nice little second breakfast in the dining room by the open window when in walked Gandalf. My dear fellow, said he, whenever are you going to come? What about an early start? And here you are having breakfast or whatever you call it at half past ten. They left you the message because they couldn't wait. What message, said poor Mr Baggins, all in a fluster. Great elephants, said Gandalf. You are not at all yourself this morning. You have never even dusted the mantelpiece. What's that got to do with it? I've had enough to do with washing up 14 people. If you had dusted the mantelpiece, you would have found this just under the clock, said Gandalf, handing Bilbo a note, written, of course, on his own notepaper. This is what he read. Thorin and company to burglar Bilbo greeting. For your hospitality, our sincerest thanks, and for your offer of professional assistance, our grateful acceptance. Terms. Cash on delivery up to and not exceeding one fourteenth of total profits if any all traveling expenses guaranteed in any event funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives if occasion arises and the matter is not otherwise arranged for thinking it unnecessary to disturb your esteemed repose we have proceeded in advance to make requisite preparations and shall await your respected person at the green dragon inn by water at 11 a.m sharp trusting that you will be punctual we have the honour to remain yours deeply, Thorin and co. So this is the agreement that the dwarves are waiting for Bilbo to join them on their adventure. That leaves you just ten minutes. You will have to run, said Gandalf. But, said Bilbo, no time for it, said the wizard. But, said Bilbo, no time for that either. Off you go. To the end of his days, Bilbo could never remember how he found himself outside without a hat, a walking stick or any money or anything that he usually took when he went out, leaving his second breakfast half finished and quite unwashed up, pushing his keys into Gandalf's hands and running as fast as his furry feet could carry him down the lane, past the great mill, across the water and then on for a mile or more. Very puffed he was when he got to buy water, just on the stroke of eleven, and found he had come without a pocket handkerchief. Bravo, said Barlin, who was standing at the inn door looking out for him. Just then, all the others came round the corner of the road from the village. They were on ponies, and each pony was slung about with all kinds of baggages, packages, parcels and paraphernalia. There was a very small pony, apparently for Bilbo. Up you two get, and off we go, said Thorin. I'm awfully sorry, said Bilbo, but I've come without my hat, and I've left my pocket handkerchief behind, and I haven't got any money, and I didn't get your note until after 10.45 to be precise. Don't be precise, said Dwalin, and don't worry. 
You will have to manage without pocket handkerchiefs and a good many other things before you get to the journey's end. As for a hat, I have a spare hood and cloak in my luggage. That's how they all came to start, jogging off from the inn one fine morning just before May on laden ponies, and Bilbo was wearing a dark green hood and a dark green cloak borrowed from Dwalin. They were too large for him and he looked rather hilarious. What his father Bungo would have thought of him, I daren't think. His only comfort was that he couldn't be mistaken for a dwarf as he had no beard. They hadn't been riding very long when up came Gandalf, very splendid on a white horse. He had brought a lot of pocket handkerchiefs and Bilbo's pipe and tobacco. So after that, the party went along very merrily and they told stories or sang songs as they rode forward all day, except of course when they stopped for meals. These didn't come quite as often as Bilbo would have liked, but he still began to feel that adventures were not so bad after all. At first they had passed through Hobbit lands, a wide, respectable country inhabited by decent folk with good roads, an inn or two, and now and then a dwarf or a farmer ambling by on business. Then they came to lands where people spoke strangely and sang songs that Bilbo had never heard of before. Now they had gone on far into the lone lands where there were no people left, no inns, and the roads grew steadily worse. Not far ahead were dreary hills rising higher and higher, dark with trees. And some of them were old castles with an evil look, as if they had been built by wicked people. Everything seemed gloomy, for the weather that day had taken a nasty turn. Mostly, it had been good as May can be, even in merry tales. But now it was cold and wet. In the lone lands, they had been obliged to camp where they could, but at least it had been dry. To think it will soon be June, grumbled Bilbo as he splashed along behind the others in a very muddy track. It was after tea time, it was pouring with rain and had been all day. His hood was dripping into his eyes, his cloak was full of water, the pony was tired and stumbled on stones and the others were too grumpy to talk. And I'm sure the rain has got into the dry clothes and into the food, thought Bilbo. Bother burgling and everything to do with it. I wish I was at home in my nice hole by the fire with a kettle just beginning to sing. It was not the last time he wished that. It means he already wants to be home. Still, the dwarves jogged on, never turning round and not taking any notice of the hobbit. Somewhere behind the grey clouds, the sun must have gone down, for it began to get dark as they went down into a deep valley with a river at the bottom. Wind got up and willows along its banks bent and sighed. Fortunately, the road went over an ancient stone bridge, for the river, swollen with the rains, came rushing down from the hills and mountains in the north. It was nearly night when they had crossed over. The wind broke up the grey clouds and a wandering moon appeared above the hills between the flying rags. And then they stopped, and Thorin muttered something about supper, and where shall we get a dry patch to sleep on? Not until then did they notice that Gandalf was missing. So far he'd come all the way with them, never saying if he was in the adventure or merely keeping them company for a while. He had eaten most, talked most and laughed most, but now he wasn't there at all. Oh, just when a wizard would have been most useful too, groaned Dory and Nori. They decided in the end that they would have to camp where they were. They moved to a clump of trees and though it was drier under them, the wind shook the rain off the leaves and the drip, drip was most annoying. Also, the mischief seemed to have got into the fire. Dwarves can make a fire almost anywhere, out of almost anything, wind or no wind, but they couldn't do it that night, not even Oin and Gloin, who were especially good at it. Then one of the ponies took fright at nothing and bolted. He got into the river before they could catch him, and before they could get him out of again, Feely and Keely were nearly drowned, and all the baggage that he carried was washed away off of him. Of course, it was mostly food, and there was mighty little left for supper and less for breakfast. There they sat, all glum and wet and muttering, while Oin and Gloin went on trying to light the fire and quarrelling about it, as they were arguing. Bilbo was sadly reflecting that adventures were not all pony rides in May sunshine when Barlin, who was always their lookout man, said, There's a light over there! There was a hill some way off with trees on it, pretty thick in parts. Out of the dark mass of the trees they could now see a light shining, a reddish, comfortable looking light, as if it might be a fire or torches twinkling. When they had looked at it for some while, they fell to arguing. Some said no, some said yes, some said they could go and see and anything was better than little supper and less breakfast and wet clothes all the night. So they're clearly not having a good time. It's pouring down with rain, their clothes are wet, they've lost some food and everyone's feeling really grumpy. 
Others said, these parts are none too well known and are too near the mountains. Travellers rarely come this way now. The old maps are no use. Things have changed for the worse and the road is unguarded. They have seldom even heard of the king round here and the less inquisitive you are as you go along, the less travel you are likely to find. Some said, after all, there are 14 of us. Others said, where has Gandalf got to? This remark was repeated by everybody. Then the rain began to pour down, worse than ever, and Oin and Gloin began to fight. That settled it. After all, we have got a burglar with us, they said, and so they made off, leading their ponies in the direction of the light. They came to the hill and were soon in the wood. Up the hill they went, but there was no proper path, and do what they could, they made a great deal of rustling and cracking and creaking, and a good deal of grumbling and dratting as they went through the trees in the pitch dark. Suddenly, the red light shone out very bright through the tree trunks not far ahead. Now it's the burglar's turn, they said, meaning Bilbo. You must go on and find out all about that light and what it's for, and if it is safe and canny, said Thorin to the hobbit. Now scuttle off and come back quick, if all is well. If not, come back if you can. If you can't come back, hoot twice like a barn owl, once like a screech owl, and we'll do what we can. Off Bilbo had to go, before he could explain that he couldn't even hoot like any kind of owl. But at any rate, hobbits can move quietly in woods, absolutely quietly. They take pride in it, and Bilbo had sniffed more than once at what he had called all this dwarvish racket as they went along, though I don't suppose you or I would have noticed anything at all on a windy night. As for Bilbo, walking primly towards the red light, I don't suppose even a weasel would have stirred a whisker at it. So naturally... He got right up to the fire, for fire it was, without disturbing anyone. And this is what he saw. Three very large persons sitting round a large fire of beech logs. They were toasting mutton on long spits of wood and licking the gravy off their fingers. There was a fine toothsome smell. There was a barrel of good drink at hand and they were drinking out of jugs. But they were trolls, obviously trolls. Even Bilbo, in spite of his sheltered life, could see that from the great heavy faces of them and their size and the shape of their legs, not to mention their language, which was not drawing them fashion at all. Mutton yesterday, mutton today, and blimey, if it don't look like mutton again tomorrow, said one of the trolls. Never a blinking bit of man flesh have we had for long enough, said the second. What the hell William was a thinking off to bring us into these parts? Beats me. And the drink running short, what's more? He said, jogging the elbow of William, who was taking a pull at his jug. William choked. <laughs> Shut your mouth, he said, as soon as he could. You can't expect folk to stop here forever just to be et by you and Bert. You've et a village and a half between you since we come down from the mountains. How much more do you want? And time's been up our way. When you'd have said, thank you, Bill, for a nice bit of fat valley mutton. Like what this is. He took a big bite off a sheep's leg he was roasting and wiped his lips on his sleeve. Yes, I am afraid trolls do behave like that, even those with only one head each. After hearing all of this, Bilbo ought to have done something at once. Either he should have gone back quietly and warned his friends that there were three fair-sized trolls at hand in a nasty mood, quite likely to try roasted dwarf or pony for a change, or else he should have done a bit of good quick burgling. A really first class and legendary burglar would have at this point picked the troll's pockets. It is nearly always worthwhile if you can manage it. Pinched the very mutton off the spits, purloined the beer and walked off without their noticing him. Others, more practical, but with less professional pride, would perhaps have stuck a dagger into each of them before they observed it. Then the night could have been spent cheerily. So there's three trolls roasting mutton and they haven't noticed Bilbo yet, but they're very hungry very angry trolls. Bilbo knew it. He had read of a good many things he had never seen or done. He was very much alarmed as well as disgusted. He wished himself a hundred miles away and yet somehow he couldn't go straight back to Thorin and company empty-handed. So he stood and hesitated in the shadows. Of the various burglarious proceedings he had heard of picking the trolls pockets seemed the least difficult. So at last he crept behind a tree just behind William. Bert and Tom went off to the barrel. William was having another drink. 
Then Bilbo plucked up the courage and put his little hand in William's enormous pocket. There was a purse in it, as big as a bag to Bilbo. Ha, thought he, warming to his new work as he carefully lifted it out. This is a beginning. It was. Trolls' purses are the mischief, and this was no exception. Ear, who are you? It squeaked as it left the pocket, and William turned round at once and grabbed Bilbo by the neck before he could duck behind the tree. Blimey, Bert, look what I've copped, said William. What is it? said the others coming up. Lummy if I knows. What, what are you? Bilbo Baggins, a burr, a hobbit, said poor Bilbo, shaking all over and wondering how to make owl noises before they throttled him. A burr, a hobbit, they said, startled. Trolls are slow in the uptake and mighty suspicious about anything new to them. What's a burr, a hobbit got to do with my pocket anyway, said William. And can you cook em? said Tom. You can try, said Bert, picking up a skewer. He wouldn't make above a mouthful, said William, who had already had a fine supper. Not when he was skinned and bones. Perhaps there are more like him round about, and we might make a pie, said Bert. Here you are. Are there any more of your sort as sneaking in these woods, you nasty little rabbit? He said, looking at the hobbit's furry feet. Yes, lots, said Bilbo, before he remembered not to give his friends away. No, none at all. Not, not one, he said immediately afterwards. What do you mean, said Bert, holding him up by his hair? What I say, said Bilbo, gasping, and please don't cook me, kind sirs. I'm a good cook myself, and cook better than I cook, if you see what I mean. I'll cook beautifully for you, a perfectly beautiful breakfast for you, if only you won't have me for supper. Poor little blighter, said William. He had already had as much supper as he could hold. Also, he had lots of beer. Poor little blighter, let him go. Not till he says what he means by lots and none at all, said Bert. I don't want to have my throat cut in my sleep. Hold his toes in the fire till he talks. I won't have it, said William. I caught him anyway. You're a fat fool, William, said Bert, as I've said afore this evening. And you're a lout. And I won't take that from you, Bill Huggins, said Bert, and put his fist in William's eye. Then there was a gorgeous row. Bilbo had just enough wits left when Bert dropped him to scramble out of the way of their feet before they were fighting like dogs. Soon they were locked in one another's arms and rolling nearly into the fire, kicking and thumping, while Tom whacked at them both with a branch to bring them to their senses. And that, of course, only made them madder. That would have been the time for Bilbo to have left, but his poor little feet had been very squashed in Bert's big paw, and he had no breath in his body, and his head was just going round. So he lay there for a while, panting just outside the circle of firelight. Right in the middle of the fight, up came Barlin. The dwarves had heard noises from a distance and after waiting for some time for Bilbo to come back or to hoot like an owl, they started off one by one to creep towards the light as quietly as they could. No sooner did Tom see Barlin come into the light that he gave an awful howl. Trolls simply detest the very sight of dwarves. Uncooked. Bert and Bill stopped fighting immediately and a sack, Tom, quick, they said, before Barlin who was wondering where in all this commotion Bilbo was, knew what was happening. A sack was over his head and he was down. There's more to come yet, said Tom, or I'm mighty mistook. Lots of none at all it is, said he. No borough hobbit, but lots of these here dwarves. That's about the shape of it. I reckon you're right, said Bert, and we'd best get out of the light. And so they did, with sacks in their hands that they used for carrying off mutton and other plunder they waited in the shadows. As each wolf came up and looked at the fire, and the spilled jugs and the gnawed mutton in surprise, pop, and a nasty smelly sack over his head and he was down. Soon, Dwanin lay by Barlin, Ophelia and Keely together, and Dory and Nori and Ori all in a heap, and Oin and Gloin and Biffa and Boffer and Bomba piled and comfortably near the fire. That'll teach them, said Tom, for Biffa and Bomba had given a lot of trouble and fought like mad. Thorin came last, and he was not caught unawares. He came expecting mischief and didn't need to see his friend's legs sticking out the sacks to tell him that things were not well. He stood outside in the shadows some way off and said, What's all this trouble? Who has been knocking my people about? It's trolls, said Bilbo from behind a tree. They'd forgotten all about him. They're hiding in the bushes with sacks, said he. Oh, are they, said Thorin, and he jumped forward to the fire before they could leap on him. He caught up a big branch all on fire at one end and Bert got that in the eye before he could step aside. That put him out of the battle for a bit. 
Bilbo did his best. He caught hold of Tom's leg as well as he could, but he was sent spinning up into the top of some bushes when Tom kicked the sparks up in Thorin's face. Tom got the branch in his teeth for that and lost one of the front ones. It made him howl, I can tell you. But just at that moment, William came behind and popped a sack right over Thorin's head and down to his toes. And so the fight ended. A nice pickle they were all in now, all neatly tied up in sacks with three angry trolls sitting by them, arguing whether they should roast them or mince them or boil them or just sit on them one by one and squash them into a jelly. And Bilbo was up in a bush with his clothes and skin torn, not daring to move in case they heard him. It was just then that Gandalf came back, but no one saw him. The trolls had just decided to roast the dwarves now and eat them later. That was Bert's idea. No good roasting him now. It'd take all night, said a voice. Bert thought it was William's. Don't start the argument all over again, Bill, he said, or it will take all night. Who's a arguing, said William, who thought it was Bert that had spoken. You are, said Bert. You're a liar, said William. And so the argument began all over again. In the end, they decided to mince them, fine and boil them. So they got a great black pot and then took out their knives. No good boiling them. We ain't got no water and it's a long way to the well, said a voice. Bert and William thought it was Tom's. Shut up, said they, or we'll never have it done. And you can fetch the water yourself if you say any more. Shut up yourself, said Tom, who thought it was William's voice. Who's arguing but you, I'd like to know. You're a booby, said William. Booby yourself, said Tom. And so the argument began all over again and went on hotter than ever until at last they decided to sit on the sacks one by one and squash them and boil them next time. Who shall we sit on first, said the voice. Better sit on the last fellow first, said Bert. He thought Tom was talking. Don't talk to yourself, said Tom. But if you want to sit on the last one, sit on him. Which is he? The one with the yellow stockings, said Bert. Nonsense. The one with the grey stockings, said a voice like William's. I made sure it was yellow, said Bert. Yellow it was, said William. Then what did you say it was grey for? I never did. Tom said it. That I never did. It was you. Who are you talking to? Now stop it, said Tom and Bert together. The night's getting on and dawn comes early. Let's get on with it. Dawn take you all and be stone to you, said a voice that sounded like William's. But it wasn't. For just that moment, the light came over the hill and there was a mighty twitter in the branches. William never spoke as he turned to stone and Bert and Tom were stuck like rocks as they looked like him. And there they stand to this day, all alone, unless the birds perch on them. The trolls, as you probably know, must be underground before dawn or they go back to the stuff of the mountains they are made of and they never move again. And that was what happened to Bert and Tom and William. Excellent, said Gandalf as he stepped from behind a tree and helped Bilbo to climb down out of the thorn bush. Then Bilbo understood. It was the wizard's voice that had kept the trolls bickering and quarrelling until the light came and made an end of them. The next thing was to untie the sacks and let out the dwarves. They were nearly suffocated and very annoyed. They hadn't enjoyed lying there listening to the trolls, making plans for roasting them and squashing them and mincing them. They had to hear Bilbo's account of what happened to him twice over before they were satisfied. Silly time to go practising pinching and pocket picking, said Bomber, when what we wanted was fire and food. And that's just what you wouldn't have got off those fellows without a struggle in any case, said Gandalf. Anyhow, you're wasting time now. Don't you realise that the trolls must have a cave or a hole dug somewhere near to hide from the sun in? We must look into it. They searched about and soon found the marks of trolls' stony boots going away through the trees. They followed the tracks up the hill until, hidden by bushes, they came on a big door of stone leading to a cave. But they couldn't open it, even though they all pushed and Gandalf tried various incantations and spells. Would this be any good? asked Bilbo when they were getting tired and angry. I found it on the ground when the trolls had their fight. He held out a largish key. Though no doubt William had bought it very small and secret, it must have fallen out of his pocket, very luckily before he was turned to stone. Why on earth didn't you mention it before, they cried. Gandalf grabbed it and fitted it into the keyhole, and then the door swung back with one big push and they all went inside. There were bones on the floor and a nasty smell was in the air. But there was a good deal of food jumbled carelessly on the shelves and on the ground, among an untidy litter of plunder, of all sorts from brass buttons to pots full of gold coins standing in a corner. There were lots of clothes too hanging on the walls. Too small for trolls. I'm afraid they belonged to victims. And among them were several swords of various makes, shapes and sizes. Two caught their eyes particularly. 
because of their beautiful scabbards and jewelled hilts. Gandalf and Thorin each took one of these, and Bilbo took a knife in a leather sheath. It would have made only a tiny pocket knife for a troll, but it was as good as a short sword for the Hobbit. These look like good blades, said the wizard, half drawing them and looking at them curiously. They were not made by any troll, nor by any smith among men in these parts and days, but when we can read the runes on them, we shall get to know more about them. Let's get out of this horrible smell, said Feely. So they carried out the pots of coins and such food as was untouched and looked fit to eat. Also, one barrel of ale, which was still full. By that time they felt like breakfast, and being very hungry, they didn't turn their noses up at what they'd got from the troll's larder. Their own provisions were very scanty, which means they hardly have any food left for themselves. Now they had bread and cheese and plenty of ale, and bacon to toast in the embers of the fire. After that they slept, for their night had been disturbed, and they did nothing more till the afternoon. Then they brought up their ponies and carried away the pots of gold and buried them very secretly not far from the track by the river, putting a great many spells over them, just in case they ever had the chance to come back and recover them. When that was done, they all mounted once more and jogged along again on the path towards the east. Where did you go to, if I may ask, said Thorin to Gandalf as they rode along. To look ahead, said he. And what brought you back in the nick of time? Looking behind said he. Exactly, said Thorin, but could you be more plain? I went on to spy out our road. It will soon become very dangerous and difficult. Also, I was anxious about replenishing our small stock of provisions. I hadn't gone very far, however, when I met a couple of friends of mine from Rivendell. Why's that? asked Bilbo. Don't interrupt, said Gandalf. You'll get there in a few days now, if we're lucky, and find out all about it. As I was saying, I met two of Elrond's people. They were hurrying along for fear of the trolls. It was me who told me that three of them had come down from the mountains and settled in the woods not far from the road, and they had frightened everyone away from the district, and they waylaid strangers. Which means that they would pounce on them and steal people. I immediately had a feeling that I was wanted back. Looking behind, I saw a fire in the distance and made for it. So now you know. Please be more careful next time, or we shall never get anywhere. Thank you, said Thorin. So that's chapter two. I hope you enjoyed it. I particularly love that. I love the bit with the trolls. I think it's really funny. Uh, see how you get on with answering the questions about it. And I can't wait to read chapter three with you next.